Moving right along, we're going to talk here about Neisseria gonorrhea. This is something you're going to see a lot if you're working in, you know, a lower income uh, clinic where you got a lot of people who aren't using condoms and stuff, maybe because they can't afford them. You're going to see this a lot if you're working in OBGYN on your OB rotation because some of the complications necessitate a gynecology referral. So you see a lot of this, and it also comes up on step one and step two and three alike. So you want to pay attention here, and I will direct you towards what you need to know for step one. If you're watching the vi these videos for step one, which they're kind of directed towards, uh, but I put some information on here that will be useful for you for step two and three. So if you're taking those, you want to pay particular attention to that. And if you're taking step one, you'll want to pay attention to it too, because it'll really impress your attendings when you get to your clinical rotations. All right. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. I put the link below in the description of the video, or you can click on the button on the upper right hand corner. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. Thank you very much in advance. All right. So, I'm not going to go into this again, but if you are unfamiliar with the gram-positive versus gram-negative cell wall, I would strongly recommend you go back and watch my overview videos of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. I go into this in great detail. You'll need to know this for step one. If you're taking step two or three, don't worry about it. You should know how the gram stain works and why it works the way it does. All right, so with Neisseria gonorrhea, we're going to go over the classification scheme. You'll want to know your algorithm and know it cold because you will get tested on that on step one. Um, they could give you a vignette and you need to know, is it oxidase positive, catalase positive? Is it a rod? Is it a cocci? Is it a curved rod? Is, does it, uh, you know, what kind of auger does it grow on? What kind of antibiotics is it susceptible to, not susceptible to? So you'll want to be familiar with that because they love to test that stuff. Is it useful clinically? Not really, but uh, they like to test that on step one. We'll talk about some of the characteristics and then we'll talk about the diseases. That should say diseases because there are a lot of them. Uh, now, if you haven't watched the overview video of the Neisseria species, go back and watch that because I talk about the, uh, the things that Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitis have in common, which is most things. Um, so I'm really going to primarily touch here on the things that are specific to Neisseria gonorrhea. Here's our algorithm. So we're over here at the gram-negative diplococci, and uh, you can see here that there are three of them. Neisseria gonorrhea is uh, basically the same as Neisseria meningitis. So it's gram-negative diplococci, it's oxidase positive, it's aerobic, uh, it's intracellular, usually in neutrophils. Uh, but the big thing that separates Neisseria gonorrhea is that it is not encapsulated. Neisseria meningitis is encapsulated. Neisseria gonorrhea is not encapsulated. And that is important. For Neisseria meningitis, we can take that capsule and we can make a vaccine against it. We can't I'm do that. I'm not sure I understand. I beg your pardon. I just activated my phone for some reason. Anyway, uh, so you cannot make a vaccine against Neisseria gonorrhea. Uh, you can against Neisseria meningitidis. Like Neisseria meningitidis, it grows on Thayer Martin auger. And I described what Thayer Martin auger is, but you need to know that Thayer Martin auger is selective for the Neisseria species. So if you aren't familiar with what that is, go back and watch the Neisseria video. Some characteristics, these virulence factors, IgA protease, helps it grow on mucosal surfaces and evade the, the innate immune uh, system. Um, it's got lipooligosaccharide, which is an endotoxin that can lead to a, a septic shock. Uh, and then it's got adhesins, uh, which demonstrate antigenic variation, which is why you can get repeated Neisseria gonorrheal infections. The distinction from Neisseria meningitidis is that it is not encapsulated and it ferments glucose only. So if they give you a, uh, a question and it's Neisseria gonorrhea and you know it, 
you need to know that it does not ferment maltose. Only Neisseria meningitidis ferments maltose. Neisseria gonorrhea, glucose only. So the way to remember that, gonorrhea is glucose only, meningitis is maltose too. All right, let's move on to our diseases. So this is the fun stuff. Big one, gonorrhea. This is gonna be the most common one you'll encounter. Gonorrhea, as you probably know, is a sexually transmitted infection. It typically presents as dysuria or pelvic tenderness, which is always accompanied by a characteristic mucopurulent discharge from the urethra or cervix. There's a lot of different discharges that you can get from the urethra or cervix. This is typically purulent, so it's whitish, greenish, yellow, and it comes out the urethra or out the cervix. Typically smells pretty bad as well because it's essentially pus. Now, a lot of cases of gonorrhea are asymptomatic, so you may not have the dysuria or pelvic tenderness, uh, you may just have the discharge, or they might not notice anything at all, and that's a problem because if it's not treated, it can lead to complications. The complications include epididymitis in men, which will present as scrotal pain and needs to be differentiated from testicular torsion. In women, it's the infamous pelvic inflammatory disease. To diagnose this, you just take uh, a urethral sample or a, a cervical sample uh, of, of the discharge and uh, you uh, can look either look at that under the microscope or you can do what will probably be asked of you on the exam is this nucleic acid amplification test or NAAT. Quick way to diagnose Neisseria gonorrhea. You can also do that for chlamydia. You'll want to check for both. So like I said, check for other STDs. If you're, You probably will be asked this on step two or three. If you diagnose one STD, you need to check for everything else. So you want to check for syphilis. You want to check for HIV. You want to check for chlamydia. Make sure that you're not just checking one and sending the patient off. For treatment for gonorrhea, you always treat both gonorrhea and chlamydia. So if you diagnose one, you treat both. So assume a chlamydial co-infection because it's very common. You'll give ceftriaxone once intramuscularly and then azithromycin orally, and that's taken for like five days. So ceftriaxone and azithromycin, you can use doxycycline in place of azithromycin. So ceftriaxone and azithromycin or ceftriaxone and doxycycline. And ceftriaxone is the one that's active against Neisseria. And you'll see that come up again and again that ceftriaxone is used for gonorrheal infections. Pelvic inflammatory disease. This is an acute ascending polymicrobial infection of the female genital tract. So it doesn't happen in men. Uh, I guess the equivalent in men would be like epididymitis. Uh, but this is only in women. And it can be caused by a lot of different things. But Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia are the most common. It is associated with pelvic pain. So this can be uterine pain, lower pelvic pain. Uh, if you do a bimanual exam, you can elicit pain uh, by palpating the cervix, and you can also get uh, adnexal tenderness. So you'll have a patient with pain when you do the bimanual exam. This may also uh, be described as dyspareunia because when, you know, something, a finger, a penis goes into the vagina, obviously you're going to be moving that stuff around. So it may be described to you that way too. Mucopurulent discharge may be present because this is affecting so uh, multiple organs. Uh, it's general inflammation. You may have fever too, so that might be given to you on the vignette. And then uh, there are complications. So anytime you have chronic inflammation, you're going to have complications related to those organs. So things like infertility, you can get adhesions within the uterus, uh, and that can uh, interfere with the ability of the egg to implant in the uterus uh, to make it down uh, that far. Or another thing that can happen is you may have an adhesion in the fallopian tube, and that may prevent the egg from getting to the uterus, but then it can implant in the fallopian tube and result in an ectopic pregnancy. If you have infection in the tubes or in the ovaries, you can get a tubo ovarian abscess. Remember, this is an ascending infection. And you can also get something called Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome, which we'll talk about next. To diagnose this, essentially, you diagnose this the same way you diagnose the STI of gonorrhea. So you, so you can do uh, the NAAT. You can get a wet mount of vaginal secretions, which you'll see florid 
neutrophils, and then you also want to check for other STDs. Now the patient is going to come in complaining of pain. Okay, they're going to be com complaining of, of, of pelvic pain. And any time you've got a woman of reproductive age complaining of pelvic pain, you always, always, always get a pregnancy test. So you want to get a beta HCG. That will probably be asked of you if you're taking step two or three. It won't be asked if you're taking step one. The treatment is pretty much the same as for gonorrhea, ceftriaxone, and azithromycin or doxycycline, but typically we use doxycycline because it's got broader coverage. Remember, this is a polymicrobial infection. If you have a patient with a severe infection, like any kind of complication, a uh, high fever, if they've got a tubal ovarian abscess, if they don't respond to conventional uh, first-line treatment of ceftriaxone and doxycycline, you'll want to use IV management and probably admit the patient to the hospital for that purpose. Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. This is a complication of pelvic inflammatory disease. So what happens is you get inflammation beyond the reproductive tract. And now the, the pathophysiology is not very well understood, but essentially what's happening here is you're getting inflammation of Glisson's capsule of the liver. So this is going to result in adhesions of the liver. Now this does not affect the parenchyma of the liver. You're not gonna have hepatitis. You're not gonna have liver dysfunction. It's just the surface of the liver. But it's inflammation and it's affecting the capsule of the liver so it can cause pain. And so what this will result in is right upper quadrant pain. And because there's nerves around there, it, the pain can get referred to the right shoulder. So right upper quadrant pain possibly referred to the right shoulder. Now, you've got a woman coming in, she's probably in her 30s or 40s because this is a complication of chronic, non-treated PID. What are you gonna think of? Right upper quadrant pain, woman of reproductive age, maybe in her 30s or 40s? Of course, you're gonna be thinking of cholecystitis. So that's gonna, you're gonna have that on your differential. Now, what's going to happen then is you're gonna get liver function tests. You'll get a right upper quadrant sonogram, possibly an abdominal CT, looking for cholecystitis, and that'll all be clean. So you're not going to have the elevated elk foss or elevated uh, bilirubin that you would see in a, a biliary tract issue. Uh, that will all be normal. What you may see on CT is some inflammation around the liver, uh, but when you get the NAAT, which we do for gonorrhea and we do for pelvic inflammatory disease, that will come back positive. Okay, so that is the picture for Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. Now, the definitive way to diagnose this is by laparoscopy and to actually visualize those adhesions um, directly. But typically, we don't need to do this. What you'll do for treatment is the same as pelvic inflammatory disease, so uh, ceftriaxone and doxycycline. Uh, then what you can do for symptomatic relief, if they continue to have pain, is you can do adhesiolysis. So you'll go in laparoscopically and cut those adhesions, and that will give them some symptomatic relief. However, anytime you're cutting adhesions, they're going to come back. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, this is something that they'll have to deal with for a long time. Next, septic arthritis. Remember that septic arthritis, the number one cause in young adults is Neisseria gonorrhea, uh, which starts out as either a symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, uh, venereal disease. And then what happens is it spreads hematogenously, seeds the synovial space, and results in a localized inflammation. Typically this is one joint and it's very tender and inflamed and red, and it restricts their range of motion. Now, what does this sound also like? It sounds kind of like gout, but the patient profile is gonna be completely different. You don't have 30 year olds coming in with gout, I suppose, unless they have like Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. Uh, but uh, keep in mind that if you're dealing with a 65 year old, it's probably gout. If you're dealing with a 30 year old, it's probably Neisseria gonorrhea. The diagnosis is by synovial fluid analysis. You can get a gram stain and culture on that, uh, but you'll wanna look at the characteristics of the fluid. This will have a very high white count. More than 50,000 is highly suggestive. You're not gonna see crystals. You're not gonna see any of the things that you would see with gout. Blood cultures are strongly recommended. Remember that this got to the joint via the blood, so you wanna look in the blood to see if there's 
any kind of uh, bacteria that's still in the blood. And you want to do this, obviously, before starting antibiotics. The treatment is ceftriaxone, but it needs to be given IV uh, because that's the only way it's actually going to get to the joint to kill off the infection. And then finally, we've got gonococcal neonatal conjunctivitis. This is a congenital disorder that affects neonates, and it's, it presents as a suppurative conjunctival inflammation with uh, like a purulent discharge coming from the eyes, and it's due to exposure to Neisseria in the vaginal tract. Now, this is important. What you'll want to remember is that this is very similar to chlamydial conjunctivitis, but the difference is Neisserial conjunctivitis, or gonococcal conjunctivitis, presents earlier. So gonococcal conjunctivitis presents within five days, whereas chlamydial conjunctivitis presents later, usually about a week or two after birth. This is diagnosed clinically, and you will treat this, uh, for one, by giving prophylactic erythromycin ointment in the eyes, and that's done for all neonates. That's universal in the U.S. You always do that. It's mandated by law. And then if it's confirmed gonococcal conjunctivitis, you'll do ceftriaxone intramuscularly or IV, uh, and, uh, and that will take care of, of the uh, general infection. This is Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. This is the violin string adhesions. Uh, that uh, are adhering to the capsule of the liver. So you may uh, be shown this on the exam and you'll need to know that it's, it stems from pelvic inflammatory disease. The number one causes are Neisseria and Chlamydia, uh, but it is indeed polymicrobial. So this will come up on your exam, I bet. If it doesn't, you're probably going to be asked it on your OB rotation, so you'll want to keep this in mind. And then this is the typical uh, purulent conjunctivitis uh, that you see uh, with the congenital uh, gonococcal infection. So you can see here it's a whitish yellow discharge. Looks a lot like what you see coming out the urethra or the cervix in a, uh, in a gonorrhea infection.